I now call to order the Society's 2370th meeting in the 145th year since its founding in 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, the oldest scientific society of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's lecture by David Kaplan. We will begin with a few announcements, followed by a reading of the minutes of the 2369th meeting and a brief recounting of the 32nd meeting of the society that took place in 1872. We will then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. Thereafter, I will present a small thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, and then adjourn the meeting to the social hour. But first, please join me in thanking the sponsors of the fall 2016 and spring 2017 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University, and a generous sponsor who has asked to remain anonymous. Like I would like to note that this lecture in particular is sponsored by our friends at the Policy Studies Organization and the APU in conjunction with their DuPont Summit that just ended. And for those of you who came over from the summit, a special welcome. And I don't know if Paul Rich or Daniel Gutierrez are in the audience, but if they are, thank you very much, Paul and Daniel, for your support of PSW. Are you here? Ah, they got tired and went home. It's been a long day. I understand they started at 6 a.m. on the DuPont Summit. I am pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected. Deborah Bell, a museum specialist, retired from the Smithsonian and a fellow of the Explorers Club, broadly interested in the natural and physical sciences. Jessica Rosardo, a next-gen sequencing project coordinator serving the NIH particularly interested in genomics, neuroscience, and quantum mechanics. Cameron Moy, a senior at Kent Island High School, an Eagle Scout and Honor Society member, particularly interested in planetary and space science, physics, astrophysics, and mathematics. Bradley Skates, a chemist with the US Navy, interested in the relationships between biology and chemistry. And David Kaplan, tonight's speaker, whose interests will no doubt be clear from his talk tonight. Please join me in welcoming them to the society. If any of our new members are present, in addition to David Kaplan, please see me after the lecture so I can give you your autographed copy of the first volume of the Bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington in which you will no doubt be fascinated to read why the society is called the Philosophical Society and why it really should be called the Scientific Society. <laughs> the minutes of the previous meeting's lecture on NASA's X-Plane program by J. Wan Shin will now be read by External Communications Director Preston Thomas. At the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C. on November 18, 2016, President Larry Milstein called the 2369th meeting of the Society to order at 8.36 p.m. He announced the order of business and welcomed new members. The minutes of the previous meeting were read and approved. President Milstein presented a summary of the 31st meeting of the Society held in 1872. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, J. Wan Shin, the Associate Administrator in the Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate at NASA. His lecture was titled, Exciting Possibilities for 21st Century Aviation, NASA's X-Plane Program. Dr. Shin began by reminding the audience that the precursor organization to NASA's aeronautics mission was founded in 1915, a few years after the Wright brothers' first flight, thus predating NASA's better-known space mission by decades. 
Dr. Shin explained that NASA aeronautics research is responsible for many of the advances that help bring civil and military aviation from the Wright Flyer into the modern era. Dr. Shin then showed a recording of the current daily commercial air traffic plotted through U.S. airspace, comprising up to 5,000 planes at one time. He explained that every flight needs to be managed within defined airways with strict separation and precise landing and takeoff times. Modern aviation safety and air traffic control procedures have made flying so safe that an individual, such as our president, could expect to fly a three-hour commercial flight every day for 9,000 years without experiencing a fatal accident, making it the safest mode of transportation in the world. Another area that NASA is collaborating with private sector to research is ultra-efficient, environmentally responsible aircraft. Technologies such as composite wings and fuselages, sawtooth exhaust nozzles, and non-circular fuselages provide substantial weight savings as well as improving fuel efficiency and reducing noise. Dr. Shin explained that the near-term development and adoption of these technologies could decrease the fuel consumption of the U.S. commercial fleet by billions of gallons of jet fuel by 2050. Dr. Shin next discussed what he called the dawn of a new era of aviation using composite materials to move beyond the performance limits of the current tube and wing airframe designs. Future designs being investigated include very long truss braced wings with non-circular fuselages and flying wing designs, all to maximize the effective lift area and engine size while mitigating engine noise. Unusual engine configurations, such as placing them at the top rear of the aircraft, may further increase efficiency by consuming the boundary layer air that is closest to the fuselage and thus creates the most aircraft drag if engines can be made to operate using the disrupted air. Dr. Shin noted that the increasing demands for high efficiency, low emissions, and reduced noise mean that aircraft designers will soon need to find ways to incorporate electric-based propulsion into their planes. Although the weight of lithium-ion batteries is currently prohibitive, early hybrid designs may be ready for flight test as soon as 2018. Dr. Shin then discussed the polarizing subject of supersonic flight. The 20th century landmark for commercial supersonic flight, the Concorde, was incredibly loud, dirty, and expensive. If supersonic flight is to be resumed, these problems must be addressed. Indeed, due to, due to the disruption and potential damage from sonic booms, commercial supersonic flight over land is currently banned in all countries. NASA has modeled variations on wing designs to create low-boom aircraft and is targeting 2020 for the first flight test. Dr. Shin also addressed the parallel development of unmanned aerial systems, or drones, and the race for safe integration of UAS into the national airspace. UAS policy issues include not only safe operation, noise and wireless spectrum, but also privacy and security concerns and simple social acceptance. Dr. Shin noted that the stakes in this race are enormous because whichever country achieves such integration will reap enormous economic benefits through the availability of new services and efficiency gains, as well as the sale of UAS hardware as the rest of the world follows suit. Dr. Shin concluded by repeating that the sky is the limit as myriad new aircraft design and propulsion technologies are poised to usher in a new era of flight and new opportunities for U.S. leadership. After the conclusion of the talk, President Milstein invited questions from the audience. Several questioners asked for more information about hypersonic flight. Dr. Shin explained that Mach 5, or five times faster than the speed of sound, is traditionally considered the threshold to hypersonic speed. The current airspeed record for jet-propelled aircraft is held by NASA's unmanned X-43, which achieved Mach 9.7, or approximately 7,400 7, miles per hour, for 10 seconds. One major application of hypersonic engineering would be building spacecraft that can take off and land horizontally, like airplanes, creating tremendous efficiency gains and lowering the cost to orbit. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At, at 10.37 p.m., President Milstein adjourned the 2,369th meeting of the society to the social hour. Temperature, 11 C. Weather, clear. Attendance, 68. Respectfully submitted, Preston Thomas, External Communications Director. I thank you, Preston. Are there any 
corrections, additions, or comments on the minutes? Well, wait a minute, <laughs> because I have, a, I have a, a, I think, a correction. You said that it was adjourned to the social hour at 10.37. I think it's 9.37, since we kick everyone out at 10, 10.30. I 30. was simply misinformed. I transcribed as I was provided, <laughs> Okay. because I was in Thailand at the time. You were out of town. You managed to find a turkey in Bangkok. I did. A black market butterball. One of these days, you'll have to tell us about it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to accept? The minutes with that one correction. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? The minutes are accepted unanimously as read and will be posted to the website in due course. The 32nd meeting of the society was held on Saturday, October 19th, 1872. President Joseph Henry was in the chair. The bulletin does not report the time of day. The meeting was called to order or the location. Joseph Henry was a primary founder of PSW and its longest serving president, leading the organization from 1871 until his death in 1878. He was the preeminent American physicist of his time, known internationally for his pioneering work on electricity and magnetism, particularly his work on electromagnetic induction, work that incidentally led to the invention of the telegraph. He and several close colleagues founded not only PSW, but also a variety of other institutions to support scientific endeavor and facilitate the communication of field and experimental results and new theoretical and mathematical works. Among these organizations are the Smithsonian Institution, which Henry served as first secretary, the National Geographical Society, the Washington Academy of Sciences, and the Cosmos Club, all still active today. At this meeting, Henry himself gave a talk on the fluctuations of the Nile River. The bulletin does not report on the contents of the talk. As some of you may know, the Nile was formed by the confluence of the Blue Nile and the White Nile at Khartoum in Sudan. The White Nile originates at Lake Victoria in Uganda, some 3,400 kilometers upstream of the confluence. The Blue Nile originates at Lake Tana in Ethiopia and flows 1,400 miles before joining the White Nile. Both of these rivers undergo very large annual cycles. The flow out of the Blue Nile, for instance, varies over 50-fold annually, from about 100 cubic meters per second in the dry season to over 5,500 in the wet season. As a result, peak flows on the Nile would undergo annual 40-fold variations from roughly 500 cubic meters per second in the dry season to over 8,000 in the wet season. The Nile flooding that the ancient Egyptians relied on for their agriculture was the result of these annual cycles. Today, the flow of the Nile is controlled not by nature's annual cycle, but by the Aswan High Dam. We can only wonder what Mr. Henry would have thought about a dam that controls the flow of water from the vast Nile River's watershed, covering about 20% of the African continent and, the, and <clears throat> most of the mighty Nile itself. Mr. J.H.C. Coffin presented maps prepared for use by an expedition to observe the transit of Venus that was then being planned for December 1874. The maps were prepared by G.W. Hill and were published as part two of papers relating to the transit of Venus, which I'm sure everybody's read. Several members of PSW at that time were involved in expeditions to observe and measure aspects of the upcoming Venus transit. They planned to use their observations to determine the size of the solar system, among other things, an effort in which they were actually quite successful. Charles S. Peirce, and it is pronounced Peirce, made a communication on stellar photometry. The bulletin doesn't report on the content of the presentation, but notes that the paper on which it was based was to be published in the annals of the Harvard College Observatory, and Peirce did publish a monograph a few years, years later on the subject. Charles 
Peirce was a very important American philosopher and scientist of the 19th century. He made notable contributions to the fields of geology, astronomy, mathematics, logic, and philosophy. He founded at least two particular fields of thought, pragmatism and semiotics. He was something of an iconoclast and not an altogether easy personality. And he ran afoul of another PSW member, Simon Newcomb, for reasons I may discuss at another meeting, leading to Newcomb's lifelong animosity to Peirce. In fact, so deep was Newcomb's dislike that he intervened personally to retard Peirce's professional advancement and block appointments that Peirce otherwise likely would have secured. Finally, E.B. Elliott made some deep, reported on some details of an investigation he'd undertaken on the invest, adjustment of census returns, a topic of some interest today. I presume that he was reporting on methods of statistical analysis, but the bulletin does not report on the content of his talk. We hope nonetheless that his presentation was met with dispassionate analysis. And we note that a PSW General Committee member, Eric Epstein, sitting in the second row there, is working for the uh, 2020 census uh, to ensure the cybersecurity of their operations and data collection. We wish him the best. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we turn to tonight's lecture on particles and the nature of nothing. And it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, David Kaplan. David is a theoretical physicist and professor at Johns Hopkins University. Before joining the faculty at Hopkins, he held postdoctoral positions at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, the Argonne National Lab, and the University of Chicago. Among other honors, he was named an outstanding junior investigator by the Department of Energy and a fellow of the Sloan Foundation, the Kavli Foundation, and the American Physical Society. As many of you know, David also created and produced Particle Fever, a documentary film about the Large Hadron Collider. He was nominated for the award for Best Producer by the Producers Guild of America for his work on the film, and he won a DuPont Journalism Award for it, among other accolades. David also has hosted science programs for the History Channel and National Geographic, and online videos for Quanta Magazine. He strongly recommends not being a filmmaker and physicist simultaneously, but by his own account, he continues to ignore his own advice. And tell you the truth, I would too if I could get away with it and do as good a job as he has at both. He earned an AB at UC Berkeley and a PhD at the University of Washington. Please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture and join me in welcoming David to the podium. Hello. Thanks for having me. Uh, what a great honor and what an, an illustrious audience I'm speaking to, as far as I can tell. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I need enough data before I make assertions. Uh, uh, so, you know, you try to aim these talks so you, you hit the average person in the audience, but I think there are no average people in this audience. So uh, I may miss completely, and I apologize. But there is time for a question and answer afterwards. Um, I am a particle physicist. Uh, there are two types. There are theorists and experimentalists. And as a theorist, I'm not allowed to touch the equipment. But I am supposed to uh, come up with organizing principles for what we've understood. And so I am going to talk to you not about the most speculative possible things that, are, that we talk about that are going to be, end up wrong and no one will talk about in 20 years. I'm going to talk about things that we already know. Usually, when you're asked by a journalist about the latest and greatest in thing, you know that that journalist doesn't know anything about quantum mechanics or even how magnets work. And so you think, well, I'm going to tell you, but it's going to, well, this is a waste of time. Well, let's go back and learn something first. So I'm going to tell you things that are known very well and the English language is limited in how you can describe them, but I'll do my best. It's obviously better described in mathematics. I've done the best with analogies. Analogies always fall short. You can call me on things. You can mutter to yourself if I've done something of bad taste. But uh, feel free to bring it up in question and answer. Particles and the nature of nothing. The first thing you learn when you, you've gone past the threshold 
in uh, learning about physics where you feel, maybe I can do this, maybe I'm good enough to, to accomplish something. You realize to mistrust your instinct, and the biggest discoveries come from assuming that your instinct is wrong, and making a leap of some kind. And, and a nice, well-defined moment where that happened is, of course, uh, the Copernican model of the universe. You take the sun, and you shove it in the center, and we're moving around at some ridiculous speed. And, of course, your instinct tells you that's not happening. You're standing still, everything's nice and calm, and you see the sun move past you across the sky. That's what the instinct says. But the great thing about that, about mistrusting your instinct and coming up with some kind of guess, is once you guess, even if you don't feel good about it the next morning, it's irrelevant. The theory is outside of your body now. It's like a song you write. No longer it belongs to you. I mean, maybe ASCAP, maybe it kind of belongs to you. But it doesn't belong to you in the sense that people can internalize it. And with uh, scientific proclamations, of course, you can test it. And, uh, and that, that is the great, for me, um, and I'm not the first one to point this out. Um, I read this in a nice book by Richard Rhodes. Um, this was, a, in a sense, a moment in, uh, in uh, Western culture where a scientific proposal, and in some sense this is not much of a scientific proposal, it's just a reorganization of an understanding, but a scientific proposal um, uh, now can be tested, lives independently of the scientist. Nobody has to believe it, you can just try to figure out if it's true. The other thing you learn when you do research uh, and you internalize it and you forget it's a thing, that there, is, there are two things happening. There are things and there are laws. And what I mean by that uh, is best described uh, by Kepler's um, desire to understand the universe. Of course, the universe to Kepler was a, uh, the sun and the six planets and the moon. And he wanted to come up with the theory of the universe, namely a theory that described uh, the six planets and their locations. And he noted that there were five platonic solids, five perfect three-dimensional regular objects. And if you circumscribe those objects inside and outside of each other with spheres in between, and you do it in the right order, perhaps you can predict the radius of the sphere in which every planet is embedded. And so these planets are moving around the sun because they're embedded in these cosmic spheres and they turn and that turning and the, the radius of those spheres can be described by something perfect, something else three-dimensional and perfect. And to his credit, he believed in the data. He believed in the data of Tycho Brahe, uh, his, uh, the guy he worked for. And the data, as far as he could tell, was accurate enough to say that his theory didn't work. As beautiful as it was, he could not get a theory to match the data, and he gave up on it. And of course, even worse, he could interpret from the data that planets don't move in circles, they move in ellipses. And an ellipse is not, it's now it's not a sphere that the planet's embedded in, it's rotating around, it's some free body in space. But he did come up with Kepler's laws, namely that the motion of the planet behaved in a very special way. Special in the sense that no matter which planet you looked at, you could say something about it. You can say something about its dynamics. A is the distance from the sun to the farthest the planet can be. T is the amount of time it takes to go around. And then on the other side is some parameter. It's the same parameter for every planet. It's interesting that they all follow this rule. What that suggests is that if another planet was discovered, and of course another planet was discovered, and then an eighth planet was discovered, and then the ninth planet was discovered, and then the ninth planet was demoted, and then there's arguments, and who knows what's a planet anymore, and of course other stars were discovered with planets too. So the, how many planets was irrelevant? This was something about the history of the formation of the solar system. That's not a deep uh, scientific uh, part of scientific research that people do. The deeper part of scientific research uh, became the laws. What are the rules? If I took I'm God, whatever that means, and I take a planet and I, and I kick it around our sun, I can tell you something about its orbit. I, there is a rule associated with this, and this, of course, leads to perhaps a deeper theory, say the theory of gravity. And that, then, is the, dis you, you can be very attached to 
something. He was attached to his theories. He was disappointed and discovered that this, we define these things from dynamics in kinematics or dynamics in the history of the process to create the thing you're looking at. So what is fundamental and what is just an artifact of where things started in the first place? Of course, you need data. And this was the thing taking the data back then. And this is a thing taking data right now. It's called the Large Hadron Collider. Um, it is a machine that lives about 300 feet under the surface of the Earth, mostly in France, a little bit in Switzerland. And uh, it is colliding particles, protons, parts of the hydrogen atom, simplest atom, uh, at extraordinarily close to the speed of light, and it's colliding them within a large enough structure that you can see what happens when you collide it. It is made of bizarrely intricate um, components, components that had to be invented for it. Um, these objects, they're electromagnetic calorimeters, but you see they look like a crystal, they're transparent, but they're actually 99% tungsten, which is a metal, however they're transparent. They don't do anything with visible light, but the higher energy particles that go in there can deposit energy and can be read out. And uh, a very large number of objects like this and other materials were invented and used and put into a machine. Some of the parts very big and they were trucked, they were flown in or trucked across Europe and through Geneva and placed in that tunnel, which is 100 meters below the surface. The components became very large and they had to be lowered very slowly. So this, it was lowered 300 feet. It took 10 hours to lower it because it weighs a significant fraction of the Eiffel Tower. So you obviously don't want to move very fast, objects like that. And once they're put in, you have 17 miles of uh, magnets and other equipment to attach. Um, and you have to move things very slowly through this tunnel, so it takes hours often just to put the part in its place. Within those tubes um, is a near-perfect vacuum throughout the 17 miles. Um, that has to be maintained. Large electric currents will be going through this tube too, 12,000 amperes, and you need so that the, the uh, copper wires or the wires don't uh, disintegrate. Um, you need to make them superconducting, and that requires tons and tons of liquid helium operating at temperatures a couple degrees above absolute zero. And so they have a very large supply of liquid helium. And then the machine runs, they take the data, and the data requires a very large array uh, of server cores or, or computer cores. They have 10,000 eight-core machines at CERN in Geneva, and then they have another 90 to 100,000 across the world at data-taking centers, and the data is taken and is distributed uh, in parallel over the world. And then, of course, it needs to be accessed by thousands and thousands of people. These thousands of people, this is a 10% of one of the four collaborations associated uh, with this experiment. They all need access to the data. The World Wide Web was invented by an engineer at CERN in order for people like this to access the particle physics data from anywhere. And of course, the World Wide Web is used for other things too. And then all these people, they come from a lot of places, many countries, including countries that don't normally collaborate on anything else, uh, China and Taiwan, Russia and Georgia, Israel, Iran, Serbia and Croatia, Pakistan, India, Cuba, the United States. You can ask why. Why go to all this trouble to build that monster, which is so complicated, took so many years, had problems, went over budget, people thought it would create black holes and destroy the planet, all kinds of painful things about why. It takes an entire, almost career to build this thing. The, the original plans were written down in the late 80s, and it really started running in earnest in 2009. Why do we do it? We say we are trying to understand the basic laws of nature. Actually, when we talk to the press, we say we are trying to uh, turn back the clock and see how the universe was created. Okay. That's not true. That's actually a di difference between history and dynamics. We're trying to figure out the rules. You look at the universe, you look back, and you can try to figure out the history. But it's a lot easier to understand the history if you know what the rules are. So we say we're recreating the Big Bang, or other people do. I don't say that. Um, we're not. 
we are going to energies at which collisions at the early universe happened, it's true, but we are trying to understand the structure. And because of deep reasons associated with all of physics itself, uh, something called renormalization, uh, the laws of nature operate on all length scales, the size of the universe, the size of this room, the size of an atom. Why do we go, why do we bother to look at the tiniest things? And it's because the action of the laws are the simplest at that level. And we're looking for those simple structures and the simple laws uh, that manifest all the complexity uh, that's in this room. But building a collider like that is asking, like asking, how does an automobile work? And you think, oh, I'll create an experiment. I'll take two uh, vehicles and I'll collide them into each other at high enough energy so that when everything's flying out, we can re produce uh, what a carburetor does, okay? So that is obviously not an effective way to, there are other things you can do, because we have tools that are smaller than the components of uh, the vehicle. We do not have tools that are smaller than the components of the proton. Our tools are made of protons. So there must be a different way, and of course there, there are deeper reasons why it's complicated than just that. You can say we're trying to understand the constituents of matter. What is all matter? made of? Well, you all know, we say, if you take, say, anything, physical matter, a glass of water, and you look closer at length scales 10 million times smaller, you see that there's structure to it. Here there are molecules, there's H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. And if you just go up a factor of 10 smaller, you see there's another structure, it's an atom. Here is a picture of an atom, which is obviously, to those of you who know any atomic physics or, or quantum mechanics, completely wrong. But every child learns that that's what an atom is, even though that's not what an atom is, fine. There's an electron and a proton, we'll agree at least on that. And then you say, okay, let's go smaller. Interesting things are happening as you go small. Let's take the electron, for example, and go 100 times smaller, and we've done that, and ask, what is the structure of the electron? And we go 100 times smaller, and we see a dot, and we think, well, there's got to be more to this. So we go 100 times, 1,000 times smaller, and you go 1,000 times smaller to the electron to look at the structure, and you see, you act, well, you don't see anything. So then you keep going another 1,000 times, and this, t then you, actually, you don't see anything either. Uh, but the LHC, see, we've done this in the, about the year 2000, we got to here, and the LHC is going another factor of 10. And what do you think we will see? Okay, yeah, that's what we do, that's right. <laughs> So, right. So, that's not the reason why we build the LHC, although, of course, it's possible. You know, you don't know when something might come up, so it's possible. You do exploratory physics because it's there, that's part of it, but that's not the motivating feature. We know an enormous amorphous about matter. We know. We see, we learn. The child, same child who gets the wrong picture of the atom, learns everything is made of atoms. Everything we know about physical matter is made of atoms. That's astounding. And the things that make up the atom have a structure, and we've studied that structure in great detail. We know a lot about it. We know a lot about matter. The LHC is taking it what looks like a very small step in that scale, but the scale of the experiment is enormous. How could that be? Is that really what we're up to? No, it's not. If everything's made of atoms, we understand everything. What are we looking for? What are we looking at at the LHC? We're looking at nothing. And we are looking very carefully. We do not uh, put this in our grant proposals, <laughs> but we do, uh, we underlying what we do is how, this is how we think about it. Now let's, let me say what I mean. I just, being glib here, of course, but what I mean. Nothing is not nothing. What I mean by nothing, we don't say nothing in, in particle physics, we say the vacuum. What is the vacuum? The vacuum of space time. What is the vacuum in which all matter lives? What is the nothing? nothing being the medium in which there are atoms. What is it? And is it important? And what is the structure of it? Uh, stuff is made of atoms. The nothing, the vacuum, is made of something else. So the Higgs, the Higgs boson, which you may have heard of, discovery a few years ago at that collider, um, is associated with understanding the vacuum of space-time. And that's what we're going to get to in this talk. First, you need to know some quantum mechanics. So I'm going to teach you quantum mechanics. I think I have three or four slides which should cover it. <laughs> so study quantum mechanics, and one in the, in the context that we care about here is in a sense a study of waves. Not real waves, although 
knowing how real waves work uh, tell you something about how quantum mechanics works. Something you know about real waves is this is uh, water, this is top-down uh, a photograph of water and water waves uh, impinging on a surface with two slits in it. And as the water waves move through the holes, they spread out. They spread out in this uh, circular pattern. And because they emanate from two points, they interfere with each other. And you see very important things happening here. There are places where the interference cancels and the waves essentially disappear. And there are waves where, places where they get enhanced. That's how waves work. We're okay with that. They use something called superposition. They add to each other, and since waves go up and down, they can add or subtract. That's okay. Particles don't, you wouldn't think, billiard balls don't tend to do that. You throw two billion balls at one spot, they collide, they add to each other. They're in the same place. There's more stuff there. Here it's not true with waves. You, add, you take two waves, you send it to the same point, they could subtract, they could cancel, there could be nothing there. So that's interesting. Water is a wave. Water, you can produce waves in water. It's a medium. Light is a wave. Light is a wave that lives, as far as we can tell, in a vacuum, meaning it's not a wave in something. It's just a wave somehow. It propagates like a wave. It acts like a wave. You take a flashlight or really monochromatic light, and you shine it like a laser. You shine it on two slits. You get the same pattern. Light is going through both holes, but there are places where there's no light, where the light perfectly cancels from the two holes. So you cover one hole, light shines everywhere, you have two holes open, and there are places where they're dark. The light gets subtracted. It's a, it's a non-intuitive aspect of how waves work. And the weird thing is that that works with light, but it also works with, for example, electrons. Take, uh, take well, this is a case of light, but take the case where you have that laser light and you turn down the brightness so tiny that you discover that light is in fact made of particles. And you allow one particle of light to move through those holes at a time. So you wait a day and you get a few dots. And you wait a couple of weeks and you get many more dots. And you wait months, a year, and you get a pattern. You get all the places where the photons hit uh, and they illuminate it on their photographic plate. And now you discover, even though the particles were coming one at a time, uh, you still get that same pattern. There are places where the particles didn't want to go. But remember, in order for the particles to know they didn't want to go here, they needed to know there were two slits, and you interfered with each other. But somehow, one particle, it looks like one particle on the photographic plate, but one particle knew to interfere with itself. It didn't somehow go through one slit or the other. It knew about both slits. Um, this is weird, but to explain this, uh, we don't think of particles simply as particles. It has properties, and you sometimes hear in the popular literature, it has wave, particle, duality, blah, blah, blah. It's just that we don't have good language to describe what they actually do. This is what they do. You see it. This weird pattern means that even what we think of as individual particles behave in a way where there's mutual interference or in self-interference. They act like waves. There's a beautiful set of lectures by Richard Feynman called the Messenger Lectures that he gave at Cornell. I strongly encourage you to watch them. It's more than three slides on quantum mechanics. Let's talk about real atoms, not the fake atom that's easy to draw that teachers show this is what it is. It's not an atom. Electrons are waves too. They're particles, but they behave as a wave. So when they're not hitting a photographic plate, they're in an atom. They're moving around in an atom. How do they move in an atom? Well, those who know chemistry uh, or physics know that waves, like in a hydrogen atom, the electron is described as an electron cloud. It essentially lives everywhere at once in this ball. You can think of it as if you have a glass of water and you, and you uh, tap it against the table, then on top of the water you get these standing waves. So the Water is vibrating on top. There's a, some kind of vibrating wave in some internal space. That's what the electron is. It's a standing wave in this ball. It's a ball of something fluctuating, but in an internal space. That's what an electron is. You know, for example, a hydrogen cannot possibly be an electron going around a proton because you ask, what is the angular momentum in the ground state of a hydrogen atom? It's zero. 
and there's no preferred direction. It can't possibly be something going around. There's nothing moving around. There's no angular momentum stored in it. It has to look different, but how do you imagine a billiard ball moving around here in a stable way with zero angular momentum and zero direction? It's not. It's a cloud. It acts like a wave in the atoms. So understanding atoms, understanding particles, is understanding the behavior of wave-like properties because when they're in their quiet state, that's how they're acting. Other little bits that are, that are very important, one is that higher energy means higher frequency waves. So your particle moving faster and faster um, has more energy, and that more energy is associated with when it's, you're asking about its wave-like properties, it's a higher frequency wave. Uh, blue light is a higher frequency than red light, and blue light contains more energy per photon, per particle, than red light does. The other thing is about the uncertainty principle. If a particle is like a wave, that means it's, no, it's not in one location at any one time. It's spread over space. When we measure it, we measure it at a certain point. And that wave turns out to translate into the probability of seeing that particle measured at any one point. And that's, that's a core part of what maybe you've heard of the uncertainty principle. Now, that's quantum mechanics, or the part that I thought would be useful. Now let's talk about investigating the vacuum. We're investigating nothing. What does that process mean? How do we investigate things? And I, we're talking about small length scales. So when we investigate something that's very small, we take a wave, like light, we bounce it off of the object, and we allow that light to bounce into our detector, known as our eye. We put it through lenses so we can see it more clearly. But there's a fundamental limit to how small you can get, and that fundamental limit is the wavelength of the light itself. Light can't resolve something tighter than that wavelength. And so if you want to look at something smaller, you need shorter wavelength, you need higher energy. Particles are waves, so the particles going around the LHC, we go higher, higher energy so we can see something smaller and smaller. But like I said, we're investigating the vacuum. We're investigating nothing. How do you bounce a wave off of nothing. That is a problem. <laughs> Let me describe the experiment that was there at CERN before the LHC. There they were colliding electrons and positrons. Positrons are the antiparticle of the electron, has exactly the same properties of the electron, except that its electric charge is opposite. And if you take an electron and positron, and you allow them to collide, as they did, um, they had 17 million successful collisions of a certain type. Electron positron came together, and once in a while, uh, two other particles would come out. I, I had some font issues here. But the two particles are the muon and the anti-muon. The muon and the anti-muon have similar properties to the electron. So electron, its antiparticle came in. What came out are two different particles, a muon and its antiparticle. And the weird thing about it is that the muon is 200 times heavier than the, pro than the electron. So you've put in electron and anti-electron, and what you've got now is something much heavier. So that defies some instinct about thinking, well, I'm breaking out part the electron, I'm looking inside what's inside the electron. Maybe the muon is inside there, but wait a minute, the muon's much heavier. How is that possible? Does that make sense? Is there some sense in which that makes sense? There are two things you infer from an experiment like that, or at least have to question. The first is that mass itself is not fundamental. Mass, the masses of the electron, its antiparticle, don't sum up to the mass of the particles coming out. So mass must not be a conserved quantity. There are processes where the mass of things change. Normally, in low energy processes, like everything we do in life, for the most part, except when you're building an experiment, um, mass is basically conserved, but we have found processes where that's not true. And that's because this equation that fits on a t-shirt, which is not the correct equation, the correct equation uh, relates energy to momentum, the kinetic energy of an object, and mass, which is in a sense a potential energy. It's some storage of energy in the particle. Which means um, if mass is not conserved, in, for a single particle, um, you could convert mass to momentum or back and forth and keep energy conserved. So in that process, when two particles collide and heavier ones come out, we conserve the energy in that process 
But the mass of the particles are different because mass is simply a form of energy. And like potential energy turns into kinetic energy when a ball rolls down the hill, two particles colliding and creating heavy, heavier particles is a conversion of kinetic energy, momentum, to mass with conserved energy. So mass is not fundamental, and we understand how to live in the bigger picture of our description of energy. So the electrons come in with large energy and large momentum and go out with smaller momentum, same energy, but a bigger mass. But it also means something a little bit more disturbing, which is that matter itself is not fundamental. Matter, material objects, can disappear or appear or become something else. In fact, you can collide the electron and positron, and what comes out are two particles of light, which we don't consider as matter. We consider as a particle, but it's a massless particle. So if matter itself is not fundamental, you can ask, what are the fundamental objects? Can I create any random thing when I collide two things together? It's just randomly producing garbage that we have to put labels on. And there were periods of time in particle physics where that's what was happening. In the 1960s, the theorists didn't know what the hell was going on, and they're producing particle, new particle every week, and we didn't know. We didn't have a good theory of what was happening. We have a better picture now. <clears throat> now I'm going to take a few slides to teach you quantum field theory. But because that's such an intimidating sounding thing, I'm going to call it lake theory. And the metaphor hopefully works to a degree. Uh, let's talk about lake. What is lake theory? Well, let's take the surface of the lake two-dimensional surface, that's the surface is what matters here. We take a rock and we drop it in the lake, and a wave travels across the lake. Now, I told you that particles in their evolution in space and time behave like waves, have wave-like properties. Well, let's call our wave a particle, just to be a little defiant. So the particle, what does the particle do? It moves across the, uh, the lake at a fixed velocity, depending on the temperature and density of the water in the lake, and uh, it it carries energy from one place to another. It sends information one side to the other. That's what a particle does, fine. So let's say that's a particle. Now let's set up an experiment. Let's say I have a theory. Deep down in the lake, below the water, there's another material. It's also a liquid. Maybe it's molasses. It's something very thick. And that molasses, I bet, if we can excite it, uh, uh, put enough energy into it, we can cause it to vibrate, and vibrations will come through, and we can prove that there's another surface down there. We just need enough energy to do it. So we take two big rocks, and we put them on either side, and the two big rocks make waves that crash into each other, and the, the excitation created here is so large that it causes the molasses itself to vibrate. And from the molasses, two waves, and I look, my special... Uh, light and, and uh, equipment, and I can see, look, there are waves moving in either direction on some lower surface. It's a thicker surface. I needed enough energy to produce those waves, but that tells me that there's something else down there. There's a surface of molasses. When there's no rocks thrown, the water is there, the molasses is there, we don't see the ripples, but we'd say that that's what's fundamental. The waves depend on whatever I throw into the lake or how much energy I put into it, but they're not the fundamental piece. We describe the fundamental piece as the surfaces. And what we then imagine in space-time is that these aren't two-dimensional surfaces, they're three-dimensional surfaces, meaning they fill all of space. And therefore, they live on top of each other. They're all accessible locally. But you need enough energy to access all of the lakes or all of those three-dimensional surfaces. And what we imagine is that there is some stack of surfaces. These are what we'd say are all the degrees of freedom of space-time itself. This is the vacuum. This tells us what is possible. And if we had enough energy uh, or a sensitive enough detector, maybe we can see the whole thing. Maybe there's a story associating them all. Maybe there's a mathematical structure that makes it complete and gives it a single origin. That's quantum field theory. <clears throat> That's what we teach in my course. That's it. One lecture, and then we go out for beer after that. Uh, stay, I'm just admitting, you know, I'm omitting the math and their consistency conditions. An issue. There are many issues, of course. But, you know, that's the, that's the sort of physical infrastructure of it. The standard model is simply a list of those lakes, those fields, we call them, that fill all of space. Um, or it's a terrible description of it, but 
They fill space-time. That's a slightly better description. It's just a list of 17 particles of fundamental fields in nature, and they, and they live in a nice, relatively beautiful structure with some crappy parts to it, and we're trying to clean those up you know, and see maybe there's something more fundamental. It's that. It's, in a sense, a list of numbers um, which describe how the, the lakes interact with each other, the particles interact with each other, and then it's quantum field theory, with this, all the machinery of quantum mechanics and special relativity, whose rules you follow to extract uh, predictions from all of this. Some of this is matter we know and love, the electron, the photon is the particle of light, and U and D are two of the quarks, and they're, in a sense, the structure of the proton and the neutron, and therefore the structure of all atoms. We don't know why the rest of this crap is here, but it is. And we, so we're trying to understand it. This is the particle that mediates the strong force, so it, it keeps the proton and neutron together. These two particles are responsible for some certain kinds of radioactive decay, otherwise they're kind of lame. Uh, these are neutrinos, which are produced, a plethora of them in the sun. They're going through your body right now, billions and billions of them every second, as it was pointed out to me earlier today. Yes, it's true. They're also kind of crappy because they're not the dark matter of the universe. They don't explain anything. So. But maybe they turn out to be important. You never know. You have to just basically take down everything. Now, this, of course, replaces the old standard model, which is fire, earth, air, and water. Uh, but, so this obviously looks simpler, but the math is much harder to, to extract from this. All right, let's talk about nothing. Again, nothing's not nothing. Again, the vacuum. Shouldn't call it nothing, but I do because it's funny. Um, the vacuum um, is where there are properties. It's where all the surfaces of those lakes are. It's the, it's the untapped part of space-time itself. And the Higgs, which is that particle I put in the middle, actually my, the editor of our film put it in the middle. He invented that. He's not a physicist, but he, he's sort of hobbyist. So he's, he's reinvented how we draw the standard model, and a lot of people now use it. Uh, so the quantum... The quantum theory of fields includes the Higgs field, and the Higgs field, like these others, are degrees of freedom in space-time, but they, it plays a, a special role in the standard model. You guys have experienced fields. You know what fields are. Field, for example, if you take magnets and you bring magnets close to each other without touching, you feel the force between them. Or uh, you bring it close to a refrigerator, it jumps out of your hand into the fridge. There's something action at a distance. But we can describe the theory without having that action at a distance. We describe the electromagnetic field that's sourced by the magnet. The magnet has a magnetic field. Say we call it a dipole field dominantly, and it falls off. It gets weaker and weaker the farther you go from the magnet. Um, it has a direction associated with it. Um, and so when you bring two magnets together, it deforms the field, deforming the field costs or adds energy, and in doing so, when you change the energy of the situation, in this case, you create a force. There's a direction associated with it, and there's a strength of the force, depending on how close the magnets are. We describe magnetic fields as a dormant field, which, if sourced, is turned on. And near a magnet, the electromagnetic field, the magnetic version of it, turns on near the magnet and gets weaker and weaker and goes to zero, far away. But we, a particle physicist, would say the electromagnetic field is simply there, but it's, there's energy stored in it when you're near a source. That's a field. You've experienced fields. The Higgs is a field, too. And the only difference is that a Higgs is a field who's turned on everywhere. It seems to be sourced by the fundamental nature of space-time itself. So unlike the magnetic field, which is sourced uh, locally, the Higgs field is turned on, but it's turned on uniformly in all places. Now, if you turn on a field uniformly, what does it do? The, the, the Higgs field can't create a force because a force has a direction associated with it. But it can do something, and what it does is it gives inertia to particles, namely mass. Mass is something that satisfies the symmetries of relativity. It's invariant. It's the same everywhere in space-time and so it doesn't have directions from it, but it is a dynamical effect that the Higgs has on particles that interact with the Higgs field. Without the Higgs, you would take, 
you could take an electron, in principle, an electron which has no mass, no inertia associated with it, it goes the speed of light. If you looked at that energy and momentum equation, if you set m to zero, you'd see that energy and momentum are the same in the units where the speed of light is one. So if the electron is going the speed of light, it would pass by the proton, it can bend its trajectory, but it will not be trapped by a proton. In order to be trapped by a proton, the electron needs some mass. And so if the Higgs field is turned on, and that's what this green tint is, the electron now has a mass, and the electron moving towards the proton, uh, it will get trapped. It can lose energy in the form of uh, massless photons, and it can go less than the speed of light and get trapped um, in an atom. And so the Higgs turning on, the Higgs field and the existence of it, is to say that um, uh, mass is given to some particles, and that mass allows matter to form, structure to form. It created matter when, as we imagine, uh, in the description of the universe, that the Higgs field turned on at some early time due to the temperature evolution. And when that phase occurred, matter could then exist. Remember that you take a field and then you throw rocks in it. And so we threw rocks in the field and we excited the Higgs boson. We meaning the people who are allowed to touch the equipment, not me, but I say it sort of euphemistically. We discovered the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson was predicted by the existence of the field. So we knew the field existed, at least the theory was that it existed, but we didn't see the particle and that would confirm that and the belief in quantum field theory confirms that the field exists. So people were looking for the particle not because they care about the particle, but because they care about the structure of space-time. And this is the indicator that it exists. And by measuring its mass, the energy stored in that particle, we get additional properties of the field. And so what the plots look like when you look for a resonance, which is what an energy at a specific value is, it looks like a bump, and we saw a bump. And then we got very excited, and they put it on the New York Times. <clears throat> and, and then some crazy fellow made a movie about it, even. Somebody who risked his career to film this, but he did okay, and now he's here. Um, this was obviously very exciting. What was exciting is, again, not the particle, not the God particle, which thankfully it doesn't say it in this title, um, but the, the fact that we knew one more piece of the puzzle, but it's a, it's an, a big piece, it's an infrastructure. Of, of how particles work. And now, the LHC is turned on again, and they're running again, they're taking data. In the next nine months, they may just find more details about the Higgs, clarify the theory better, measure things more precisely, or we could discover something else. The standard model is, is a semi-complete. It's mathematically complete for the energies that we're probing, so we're not guaranteed anything else. But we could see something else. And there are things out there that we, we speculate about that they exist. We just don't know their detailed properties. And the, the clearest one is something we call dark matter. Dark matter, um, uh, it's, it's an unfortunate name. It makes it sound very mysterious. For particle physicists, the, the bet is that dark matter is something prosaic. It's a new particle or a new set of particles. Now, the more exciting way to say it, which is true, so you can, I feel something when I say it too, so it's not bad to feel something. Dark matter would, is matter, it's the one matter we have evidence of that we know is not made of atoms. It's made something else. And it's roughly 80% of the matter in the universe, and we don't actually know what it's made of. So you're told everything is made of atoms, and then you're given a picture of an atom and it's wrong, and then you actually discover that atoms are not everything, that there's other things, and most of the universe is not made of atoms, it's something else. But since we don't know what it is, we ignore it, and we talk about the atoms and, and pat ourselves on the back. So dark matter, it could be uh, particles, it could be more exotic ideas, but if it's not even particles, it requires even crazier things. But the simplest statement then is, if dark matter is a gas of particles that dominate the universe, creates the structure of galaxies, etc., that means there's a dark matter field, we can create it, or perhaps dark matter has interactions other than gravitational, and we can detect it. So dark matter, of all of the sort of mysteries that we point out in fundamental physics, dark matter is the most physical. 
It's a dynamical thing that we don't understand and we know we don't have the theory for it. Almost all other mysteries in fundamental physics are about very strange numbers or initial conditions of the universe, which are deep things but sound a little philosophical. This is not philosophical. We don't know what it is. It's most of the universe. Some people think that's embarrassing. I think it's exciting. Okay. <clears throat> many, many years ago, it was, it was noted um, that uh, there was a problem in galaxies. They're called rotation curves. Vera Rubin is very famous for having uh, cataloged these and pointing out um, that, that if you look at a galaxy, you can detect using the Doppler shift, as things move towards you or away from you, how fast things are moving. And because you can get a rough picture of the mass of stuff in a galaxy, you know that stuff that's farther away and going in a circle must be going slower because the gravity force is weaker out here. And because it's weaker out here, you have to go slower to stay in orbit. But to the surprise of many astronomers, the, the speed of material that was going around galaxies, this maybe is M31, I think, the, the speed of materials going around the galaxies, as you go farther and farther out, it basically stays the same. It doesn't slow down, but somehow it stays in orbit, which says you can either say, well, I, we don't understand the gravitational force, but we seem to understand it in so many other contexts, or a simpler explanation is that there's matter distributed in a, at a much larger scale within these galaxies, and we just don't see it. And so there's additional matter here that's being picked up that's becoming more and more important as you get away from the visible matter at the center. So this is the proposal, dark matter. But after doing a lot of studies over long periods of time, it became clear that dark matter is literally invisible. It does not interact with light, at least if it's a gas of particles. If it doesn't interact with light, it's not made of atoms. That's a very cursory way to say it, but at great detail, that appears to be what's the case. Yes, and I'm going to tell you a number of things about it. First, the way what we know about dark matter is it's a material that uh, interacts with gravity. So the theory of gravity um, is extremely restrictive. Anything you add to nature must interact with gravity uh, through the laws of general relativity. And laws of general relativity say that light bends around matter. It's in effect attracted by matter. The path of a light beam as it goes through past something heavy uh, will change direction. This is called gravitational lensing. And so, in fact, gravitational lensing is now a way that we measure the mass uh, of objects, galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And so, you can map out the structure of matter in the universe, and you can see even places where dark matter exists, something that does not interact with light, but does interact with gravity. You can weigh these galaxies and the clusters, and you can see how dark matter is distributed. It really does act like matter that interacts with gravity. We speculate about what it could be. It could be clumps of non-luminous stuff. We know so much about the evolution of the universe that we know that those clumps, um, it turns out, can't be made of atoms, even the clumps, if that's what they were. They'd have to be made of some new material. Simpler is simply a gas of particles. That new material can just uh, pervade the entire universe, um, but still be cold in that it can be moving slowly enough to attract itself to each other and form galaxies. It could be that general relativity itself is simply wrong. It's right in every other context except in the context of weighing galaxies. Uh, there has not been real progress in attempts to figure out theories that can match all the successes of general relativity and, and still account for these strange movements of stars. This, in a sense, is the most trivial possibility, that it is a gas of particles, but we just don't know what those particles do or what other interactions they have. So people simulate, uh, assuming that there is a dark matter, it's a gas of non-interacting particles other than gravity, um, with tiny perturbations, perturbations that you can read off of the cosmic microwave background. You say those perturbations also exist in whatever dark matter is, and you evolve it on a computer in time. And the structures you produce are, are amazingly similar, even at the mathematical level, in terms of, let's say, the Fourier 
transform of this looks a lot like the structure of galaxies and galactic clusters. Um, so in fact, not only that, dark matter, its behavior appears to be something that can create structure, and those little blobs where dark matter is the densest are places where regular matter falls in, is attracted, and galaxies form. This is the so-called millennium simulation. So it's the biggest dark matter simulation at the time, it was the year 2000, and you're now moving through the end result of a simulation, and you see a structure that sort of looks like the universe, bright spots, which could be galaxies or clusters of galaxies. But you see these filaments that run through it, and the filaments are not dense enough to attract visible matter, so we don't see them. But gravitational lensing allows us to see the beginnings of some of these structures. So not only do the simulations predict the correct distribution of galaxies, it predicts these filaments, and the filaments are now things that we can see, but using gravity, uh, gravitational attraction and not light. It still doesn't mean we know in detail what the, the fundamental interactions of those objects are that make up dark matter, but we know many of the things that it does do and what it, what it can't be. Dark matter, if it interacts with particles in such a way that you could produce it at the Large Hadron Collider, the problem with it would be that it is invisible, meaning it's produced in the collider and it leaves and it doesn't interact with our detector. That's a little depressing, so then we say, well, there's conservation of momentum and we add an arrow there and we say that's the direction dark matter must have gone. So you look for events where nothing is going in one direction. Now, that may seem ridiculous, but we see another particle in this way. We see neutrinos. Neutrinos also don't interact with detectors uh, with, with much probability. And so we similarly see the invisible uh, implied path of the neutrinos. And because we know their properties, we can confirm uh, when neutrinos appear. The hope is you go to high enough energies, you may produce events where, again, momentum seems to be missing from the event, and we can infer that there's a new invisible particle. Not necessarily that it's dark matter, but it gives us some clues. A more likely way dark matter would be detected, and what I mean by is see the properties of the dark matter, is by taking experiments which are incredibly sensitive, but are hidden deep from all other objects. So this is a WIMP detector, a weakly interacting massive particle detector. That's a favorite uh, idea for what dark matter could be. And these detectors are incredibly sensitive and they're put deep into mines. This is the Sudan mine in, in Minnesota. And uh, that's to protect it from cosmic rays and other pollution. And you just sit there and wait. And you wait for years and take data and see if one of the millions of particles coming through the detector has an odd chance of interacting with the nucleus. This is how, in a sense, different material, but this is how neutrinos are detected from the sun. You, you have a, a very quiet environment, and the neutrino, which interacts so weakly that it almost always passes through your detector without stopping, once in a while it does hit something, and when it hits something, it creates a flash. And so these are very sophisticated detectors to both see the dark matter and to rule out uh, other explanations for it. But so far, uh, it has not been seen. Now, there are other deeper seeming questions. Let's see, what time is it? 9.20. How are you guys doing? It's getting dense. You okay? Everybody's okay. okay. Take a deep breath. Oxygen's good for this sort of thing. Okay. <clears throat> so there, there are other questions that don't have uh, the benefit of uh, having a physical presence that we can't understand. And what I mean by understand is know what in detail is causing it. Um, one of those mysteries um, is the mystery of the Higgs mass itself. I said that the Higgs is responsible for mass for fundamental particles. We don't actually know what is responsible for the mass of the Higgs itself. Uh, that's something we simply put in by hand in the theory, but we can ask, where does that mass come from? In fact, all masses that the Higgs creates are proportional to that number. So this is a fundamental number in some sense right now. It's one of the fundamental parameters of nature. It's responsible, therefore, for the size of atoms, and it's also responsible, in a sense, for the size of the disk of our galaxy. So we can ask why 
that where did that number come from? Does it come from something even more fundamental? We can ask, does it come from the scale, the energy associated with gravity itself? Maybe that's it. Uh, Newton's constant is a dimensionful constant. It has an energy scale associated with it. So we can ask, maybe the Higgs mass connect, comes from Newton's gravity or Einstein's gravity, that constant of nature. And if you assume that, you can ask about the full quantum theory, all the lakes, all the fields that live in space-time, and all the quantum effects of those space-time. If you look deeply into the vacuum, you'd see, and we see a little bit of this at the LHC, there are quantum fluctuations in all of those fields. They're not quiet. The vacuum is a actually a very violent place. And the Higgs has a special property that it's extremely sensitive to these quantum fluctuations. And in fact, when you estimate you say, oh, it must come from Newton's gravity or Newton's constant. You estimate the mass of the Higgs, and you find a number that is, um, let's see, what is this number called? Billion, trillion, 10 quadrillion times the mass that it actually is. In other words, this, while it's not a calculation, it gives you an order of magnitude estimate of the mass scale of the Higgs, the mass scale, therefore, of all uh, fundamental particles. And the mystery is why it comes out with a number that seemed to ignore the fact that there are these quantum fluctuations. This is something that people have tried to understand, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to explain a model to you that people use to try to understand it. And first I'm going to do a simpler model, because the simpler model is easier to understand. So the simpler model is to imagine that there are extra dimensions of space. This is not the actual model, but this unfortunately turns out to be simpler than the one that I'm going to name, but not describe very well. What are extra dimensions? Well, you have to, there's no way I can imagine that one can picture extra dimensions. So you, again, you have to make analogy. Extra dimensions of space might be described in the following way. Let's say you live on a two-dimensional sheet, and uh, you only know two dimensions. It's your whole life. And then three dimensions exist, but you're not aware of it, and objects from the three dimensions can pass through your dimensions and what that might look like is if you're on the surface is a circle might appear all of a sudden, grow, stop growing, and then shrink and disappear. That would be the effect of an extra dimensional object passing through it. So in three dimensions, you live in three dimensions, you're standing around and all of a sudden a ball appears out of nowhere, grows to some size, gets smaller and disappears. And that would be an effect of a kind of extra dimension. Um, we don't spend a lot of money on those experiments, but uh, that has not been seen. But I can, we haven't tested it maybe systematically. Now, the extra dimensions of, of that nature uh, cause many other problems associated with gravity. And so more likely versions of extra dimensions uh, are in which the extra dimensions are so-called curled up. Maybe as a kid, you thought, uh, I wonder if I go in this direction uh, forever if I come back the other way and meet myself and I can come back to the same spot. We would say that if that's true, then that physical dimension is compactified. It's just, it has continuous boundary conditions. There are always things you can write down in mathematics that make you queasy in real physical world, but there are many things that have been discovered that make us queasy, so we just have to get used to it. Um, so if they're extra dimensions, they could have that property, but the length scale associated with them could be very tiny. Now, if that's true, um, remember particles don't just act like particles, they act like waves, especially if you're not messing with them. So their evolution might not be a particle moving around the extra dimension. It would have to act like a wave. But if the dimension closes in on itself, the wave has to be continuous. So there's some rules. It's like in the case of a string. You have a string that's tied to a pole, and you, you shake the string, it has certain modes of vibration. The vibration needs to stop at your hand and at the pole. So only very specific wavelengths will fit on this string. Very specific frequencies. Frequencies are associated with energy. Very specific tower of energies are available for this string and also for the extra dimension. Waves that go around the extra dimension have to have integer number of nodes. And that means an integer number of nodes or integer spaced frequencies of the wave, which are integer spaced energies. When we collide particles, if we knocked a particle 
allowed it to move in an extra dimension, how would we see it? We wouldn't see something going around the extra dimension. We would see, well, our particles are, are big and floppy and low energy and, and fill up an atom. They can't see something as tiny as these extra dimensions. But that momentum in the extra dimension, to us, will be another form of energy, not motion, but it will look like mass. And so if the electron could go in extra dimensions, there would be an electron mode that didn't move in extra dimensions, but then there would be modes that had different frequencies, and they would have different energies, and we'd interpret them as mass. And so we would see a tower of particles. We'd see the particles we know, and then equally spaced energies of, other par of the same property of particles, but equally spaced by an energy scale that we can invert and, and uh, uh, align with the size of that extra dimension. Again, a toy model. It's, it's, the real model is, is a little worse. Supersymmetry, which maybe for some reason you might have heard of. Um, supersymmetry is a model, and it's a model of an extra dimension. It's like an extra dimension, except we would say it's a fermionic extra dimension, or it has quantum mechanical properties. Um, so the extra dimension itself is not continuous, it's, it's like a discrete variable. You see, it's not, there's nothing you can say. What can I say? So there, here's the supersymmetric extra dimension, that, and the bizarre properties of it, which are related in an interesting way to the Fermi exclusion or Pauli exclusion principle, um, uh, tell you that actually you can only have one mode. And so you'd see the standard model particles, and then there's one copy of them, and they're all roughly at the same mass. And that's the size of the supersymmetric extra dimension. And so the proposal for supersymmetry is that there's another set of particles that essentially match the particles of the standard model, another set of lakes or fields, and they're at a new mass scale, and that's associated with the compactification scale of supersymmetry, or we would say the supersymmetry breaking scale. And the amazing property of supersymmetry is it's a symmetry in which these vacuum, violent vacuum fluctuations mathematically cancel. It's a property of the symmetry. And the Higgs mass then no longer needs to be 10 quadrillion times what it is. The Higgs mass is proportional to the mass scale of these new particles. And so the LHC could probe the Higgs, but it could probe also potential other mysteries about the Higgs. And one possibility was to see a new set of particles that gave a symmetry structure that explained the origin of the Higgs and the origin of all mass. The supersymmetry has enough stuff in it that uh, the simplest version of supersymmetry has a nice candidate uh, for dark matter, it turned out. So it became even a more popular theory um, because without asking for it, you produce a particle uh, which should have been produced in the early universe and could explain dark matter. So people got excited about it. And there's no direct hint of this theory. And we've looked at the LHC, we haven't seen it. And maybe in the next nine months when the data comes in with more energy, more about, we'll see it, but maybe not. I suspect not, I'm betting against it. Even though in the movie I was for it, I'm, I'm again. <laughs> you know, in the movie, you, you need, one of the simplifications is each person, in a sense, personifies a theory. So it's a caricature of theory. But in fact, both myself and Nima and Savas and all the other people in our field that debate is happening in our head all the time. So you're seeing two th sides of our thinking. The mornings we get up and believe that there's order in the universe, and the other mornings. <laughs> there's no direct hint. Is supersymmetry this? It's this thing with spheres and perfect solids and thing, and we're fooling ourselves? And we should just, and it, it, this supersymmetry, the, the Higgs is not um, uh, a dynamical underlying part of the theory. The Higgs is a historical accident. What would it mean for the Higgs to be a historical accident? Well, let's ask another question. Does the Earth need a deep reason to exist and support life? In the sense that it's amazing that Earth has all the amazing important properties that we can survive on it. How did we get so lucky to be born on a planet where we can survive? That's amazing, of course not. You don't ask, nobody's working on that mystery. Why? We, we're an artifact of the fact that this place is a good place to live. And we've discovered six, seven, eight, nine, hundreds, thousands, soon tens of thousands of extrasolar planets. If you do a rough estimate, 
there are a trillion planets in our galaxy, and there are 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. What are the chances that the properties are nice? Somewhere. Good. They're good. It's not a mystery then. Okay. Well, that, that's fine. That, that's something you don't work on. This is a historical accident. It's not a mystery. It's not a fine-tuning of parameters. People talk about something called the multiverse. What is the multiverse? The multiverse is actually, it can be something much simpler sounding, so I'm going to tell you that, dispel some of the mystery sounding part of it. We can only see a finite part of our universe, but that's because of the finite age of this part of the universe and the finite speed of light. You can't see infinitely far. So our patch of the universe may have certain properties, but other places in space-time, too far for us to detect yet, uh, may have other properties. Things that we think are fundamental, the parameters in the standard model, they may be different in different parts of space-time. In fact, the, a bigger mystery than the Higgs is something called the cosmological constant problem, which could have a dramatic impact on the evolution of our universe, which in fact is the best explanation currently for the fact that our universe is not only expanding, it's accelerating. But the value of the cosmological constant turns out to be 123 orders of magnitude smaller than we would estimate from those vacuum fluctuations. So that is the worst estimate that we've ever made in history. And because of it, you start thinking crazy thoughts. And so one possibility is that in space-time, there are patches where the vacuum energy, the thing that expands the universe, takes on different values. And there are places where they, that, those values are accidentally tiny. And if there's enough structure in the space-time so that you can have a finely grained, in a sense, scanning of parameters, there will be places which are anomalies, which are aberrant parts of the universe. And if the Earth is an aberrant planet, a rare planet where life can grow, then perhaps our space-time, the part of space-time that we have access to, is also aberrant. The parameters are special there by accident, not because of the fundamental theory, but by accident, because that the parameters change over larger distance scales than we have at least naive visible access to. Now, in order for that to be true, uh, this is roughly how many patches of the universe we need. So we need the size of our universe at least times this, and even size is not a good measure because of size is not an invariant thing in, in cosmology. So, but that means you have an insane number of universes. If you have that, you know, we get surprised by big numbers we discover. If the universe really is that much bigger, then there's an, at least an argument for this. This is not a complete theory. There are issues with this. There are things called um, horizons between the parts of this universe. In some sense, different parts of the universe don't exist in the same theory. Quantum mechanics breaks off different parts. It's similar to black hole paradoxes. It's not a complete picture. There are arguments about this, obviously. Um, but it's possible, or in a broader way of stating it, it's possible that that answer is beyond our reach, that the question of where did the Higgs mass come from is one of those questions that we don't get to know the answer to, just like why are there six planets going around our sun at the distances they are. Big. It's big, yeah. <laughs> Actually, when I was a kid, I remember looking up a dictionary, wanting to know are there names for numbers bigger and bigger and bigger. The biggest number in that dictionary at the time was a centillion, which is 303 zeros. Centi you take the first three, you don't you ignore those, and every batch of three, you count one, two, three, million, billion, trillion, quadrillion. So centillion is 100 batches of those. So we don't, we, we need more than that. Doing physics means living with the uncertainty principle, not just the one in quantum mechanics, but you never know if you're on a dead end. But of course, we all need to be working hard for one of us, any of us, to get the answer. It's all part of the process. And you do it because you can't help yourself. And I just want to thank you with that last note. <clears throat>
ask a question. But first, tell us your name and whether you're a member of the society. First question here in the third row. Second question, yes, you. Hello, my name is Tony. I'm not a member yet. Hey. Um, my question is, um, a lot of data was um, at 123.5 um, GEV. GEV, thank you. They, they found the, the Higgs boson. How do they know it was the Higgs boson and not something else, one of these other particles? Right. Um, the, 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 there's a list of particles and then there's a list of interactions. And those list of interactions are first proposed. They, they, uh, they preserve the symmetries that appear to be true in nature, the symmetries of relativity, the rules of quantum mechanics. And we have a set of interactions and we have to figure out the strength of those interactions. Amazingly, you take the standard model and you add the Higgs. If you measured all other properties in the standard model, um, besides seeing the Higgs, then you've fixed the theory up to a single parameter, which is the mass of the Higgs. So once you measure a particle, a new particle that you think might be the Higgs, and it has a mass, then you have a proposal for a complete theory, which is to say that I know how that Higgs must behave. That Higgs is not actually literally seen as a particle that comes out and then we bounce things off of it to see if it's the Higgs. It decays instantly, instantly in terms of the time scales of the detector. So what we knew about the Higgs is depending on its mass, we knew how it would decay. What would be the property of the things coming out? And if you add the energy and momentum of the things coming out, um, from that you get a mass. That's that equation, E squared equals B squared plus M squared. So for every time, so we look for the byproducts of the Higgs, what the Higgs could produce. We, at, for every event, we add up uh, the energy and we, we produce a plot. And there's a lot of random stuff that comes out. And then there's a place where at some energy, the same thing is coming out over and over again. And then we have to match. We say the Higgs could decay into photons, it could decay into this kind of quark, et cetera. That's what the theory says. Let's see if the ratio of the, of the number of times this object decays into this or that, the other thing, satisfies all the conditions that the standard model requires to be a consistent theory. Then, at that point, so it's past those consistency conditions, at that point we call it the Higgs. Why do we call it the Higgs? Because the, the theory that describes everything we know so far has a particle with those properties and it's the Higgs. There's nothing special about the Higgs we call it the, the, in fact, Peter Higgs, when he wrote down the model of the Higgs, is not the Higgs that we discovered, it's something completely different. In fact, he was trying to solve another problem, which was, turned out to be wrong, and, uh, and a guy named Steven Weinberg scooped up that little theory and plugged it into what was gonna become the standard model. And that now was labeled the Higgs for historical reasons. But really, it's a particle that has certain properties and it explains something specific, which is, how do fundamental particles get mass? And because of that, you can predict that the Higgs will decay into heavier particles more often than lighter particles. Because if the Higgs gives mass to particles, the heavier particles must have a stronger interaction with the Higgs than the lighter particles. So the Higgs decays into heavier particles more frequently. And we can predict those ratios based on the mass of those particles. And so from that, we know what it should behave as, and we up to, let's say, 10% accuracy, it still satisfies those properties. But we keep digging. If at 1% it no longer satisfies the properties, 1% is enough, small enough that you still call it the Higgs, but you say there's something else interacting with the Higgs that's disturbing the properties and you're looking for something else. But right now it, it, it decays in a very special set of ways in which the only way we know how to describe it is a particle that gives mass to other particles, and we call that the Higgs. Uh, Scott Matthews, uh, currently not a member, but... Um, Me neither. Uh, my, my question, actually, you, are, you are a member now. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> well, recent, about time you became a member. Re recent uh, results in solar neutrino physics, specifically uh, neutrino flavor oscillation, seem to indicate that neutrinos have mass. They have a finite mass. The standard model, as I understand it, predicts that neutrinos should be massless. If the mass of these particles in the standard model is somehow being created by the Higgs, 
Uh, does this mean that we need, that the standard model needs some ad hoc assumption, adding some mass in for the neutrinos, or can the mass of the neutrino not be explained by the standard model because of the Higgs mechanism? Good. Um, so yeah, the simplest version of the, the, the standard model includes neutrinos, which I disparage and I shouldn't, I should treat all particles the same. Um, but the neutrinos, uh, in the simplest writing, it's an artifact of um, how uh, quantum field theorists used to think about theories. Um, we've dispelled some kind of crappy habits. When you're first discovering something, you, know, you don't know what you're doing, so you make mistakes. The electron, for example, has a negative charge. That's about the stupidest thing I could imagine. Electron she moves current. They thought it was moving this direction, but it was holes. And they made a mistake, so they labeled that plus, but then they discover the fundamental. Anyway, that's what happens. In the same way, it turns out that the standard model uh, does allow neutrino masses. But it allows them, once you add what's called higher order effects or higher dimensional operators, it still points to something new. The structure is there, but it points to a new energy scale. And so, there is, it doesn't mean that's the way that neutrinos get mass. It could be even another thing. It could be extra particles that mix with the neutrinos and give them mass. But it is possible to take the standard model, add mathematically allowed terms, and you get a mass. And in fact, what's beautiful about it is you add those terms because those terms are higher order, higher dimensional, uh, not, not extra dimensions, but uh, higher order, um, they're tinier. And so by, uh, by fiat, they automatically predict that the neutrino mass is much higher, or much tinier than the masses of all the regular matter particles. It's called the seesaw mechanism. It's, uh, there's a high energy scale associated that we don't know that physics, we don't have a big enough collider for it, but if you assume there's some physics at high energies, you have to write down these interaction terms, and when you do, you discover the Higgs also gives a mass to neutrinos, but it's just much tinier. And, but now it's just labeling. Some people say, no, neutrino masses are beyond the standard model. Other people say, no, it's a trivial addition to the standard model. Somewhere in between. This is just syntax. But it turns out, semantics, exactly. So this, it, it just turns out that it, it was easier than expected. And in the time when, that, when the mechanism for giving neutrino mass was discovered theoretically, it was sort of an astounding thing that you could do that. Now the way we see quantum field theory is very different, and, but there's an artifact in the language still. So yes, neutrinos are beyond the standard model written down in 1967 and 71 and 73, but they're beyond a standard model in a very simple uh, but beautiful way. And then you can ask, um, well, what is the energy scale the new energy scale associated with the neutrino. At very high energies, something is happening. It turns out the neutrinos predict that at very, very high energies, you'll see something new, something beyond the standard model. So that's a nice thing. It just turns out it's, um, it's probably 10 to the 12 times higher energy than the LHC. So we're not gonna see it, unfortunately. So that's the unfortunate aspect of that. That may not be the way neutrinos get a mass, it could be other things. And the best way to study neutrinos are, are neutrino experiments, where you, you look at detailed properties. The high energy behavior, maybe we'll see structure to the neutrino that's interesting, or maybe it'll be like an electron, you know, a dot, 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 dot. A question in the back there, do you have the mic? Uh, Glenn Chinnery, not a member yet. Um, David, is there an antimatter complementary particle to the Higgs? Um, the Higgs turns out to be its own antimatter. It's similar to the photon. The photon is also its own antiparticle. Um, it doesn't mean there aren't, aren't uh, uh, other family members associated with the Higgs, but whatever it would be, it would have to be an extension to the standard model. In the case of supersymmetry, there's a prediction that there's more stuff too. That's a question, yeah. Uh, about how long do you think uh, the Large Hadron Collider is going to be like at the forefront of particle physics and like how long is it going to be keep making these kinds of discoveries and what kind of machine would succeed it? Yeah. Um, 
12 months. <laughs> in 12 months, um, we'll get a lot of data. And, uh, you know, we, we, it's, it, you measure in orders of magnitude. So we have a tiny bit of data. Within, let's say, say nine months, there'll be an order of magnitude more data. And once you have an order of magnitude more data, you have an order of magnitude in some sense more sensitivity. Um, after that, then you, instead of a year, you have to wait 10 years to get more sensitivity. And then 100. So then it, then it becomes impossible. So the, in a year, we'll have more sensitivity, a lot more. And if we see something new, then the LHC is just at the forefront for the decade after that, as they try to work out what the hell we're seeing. Because the Higgs was anticipated like no other particle. But what comes next is not. Everything else is, is now. The Higgs may be the tip of an iceberg, and if it is, we don't know what the iceberg's made of. Could also just be something floating around in the water. So um, it depends what happens in the next 12 months. If they don't see anything, it's a 10 years of mop-up work. And, or maybe seeing something you know, in the nooks and crannies of the data that are hard to extract in a trivial way. Then the forefront becomes, if you want to go to higher energies, it's a bigger machine. But the other possibility, so they're talking about 100 kilometers in China. They're doing all, thinking about lots of different possibilities. Um, but, but because the timescales for these experiments are now turning into an entire academic career, um, people are trying to get more clever. And uh, dark matter is a great uh, example of it because dark matter is in some sense very simple. It, it could be a new particle, but its mass uh, has a big impact on its, its uh, quantum properties. If the particle of dark matter is very heavy, it acts like a billiard ball and could interact in interesting ways. You could see it in a mine. But if dark matter is extremely light, its wavelength could be so large, macroscopic, you could see it as uh, it affects uh, pulsar timing or, or vibrational experiments on the Earth or things that look for gravity waves, but actually much simpler experiments. Lots of different ways to detect it, using lots of different types of technology. And uh, the LHC had, had a focusing effect on our community, but I think if the LHC is not the forefront in a year from now, uh, you'll see a dispersion into all kinds of weird directions. And then I can't predict. Um, I'll be thinking about dark matter. I'm, I'm already thinking about dark matter. I'm not thinking about the LHC, because I've made my bet. And uh, not financial, I can't afford it. With my feet, you bet with your time, more important. Um, and, uh, and then I think about slightly more theoretical things that don't have immediate experimental uh, uh, consequences, but sort of broader context. So I don't know. The real answer is I have no idea. I don't know. I think there was one in the back. And uh, then uh, Mr. Rothschild. Okay. My name's Jack. I'm not a scientist, but since retiring, I've read about a half a dozen to a dozen books on quantum physics. Are you a member of the... No. Oh. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Uh, and one of the bizarre things about the way quantum physicists think is it's not at all like the rest of us. <laughs> the two-slit experiment I've read over and over again from 12 <laughs> different people and they all just ignore what most of us would consider the obvious explanation. Oh. That there is particles, and that the particles like photons and electrons produce waves in those particles. So there is no need to call an electron a wave. It's a particle that creates waves. Why? Do all of these quantum physicists never acknowledge that as a possibility and explain why they reject it? I think the, the main problem with quantum mechanics is language. We're describing phenomena in such a way, and especially in popular books on quantum mechanics and things like that, we say things that sound, I think, a little trite. It's a particle and it's a wave. Um, it's not a wave in the way we normally think of waves, as something that's fluctuating in a medium. What we mean by waves is that there's a differential equation, there's an equation with derivatives 
Derivatives are slopes and change in time and space. And the electron satisfies that equation. The electron evolves in time and space associated with that equation. And when you interact with the electron at short distances, you, you might describe it as a particle because you see a dot. And you say, oh, that's a particle. It can transfer energy locally in a small way. When you're, when you're interacting with an electron in a broader way, in a more coherent way, it follows that differential equation, but the properties look different. So you would describe the properties because when you were a kid, there was a wave experiment, and you understood that wave experiment as, look, things pass through both and they interfere with each other. So the propagation of the electron from one place to another, or the photon from one place to another, follows that equation, the equation of motion, and that equation of motion predicts interference if you have both holes. If you close one hole, it doesn't. It predicts something different. Now we try to put labels on it and say it's a particle, it's like billiard balls. It's not. It's like this or that. It's not. It's just not. It's not like things that interact at larger scales. It's things that interact, it's a different set of rules. And now you say, so I want to describe it as the public, it's so beautiful and mysterious. And you have to use the same English language. But it's, it's not correct. It's not a good description of it. Can I just ask one follow-up? Yeah. Why don't we consider it like a missile? If we shot a missile through water and gave it two, two slits to go through, we know that the wave that that missile created would go through the other side and would interfere with the waves that it continues to produce. And we know that that missile will not wind up in the same spot Is this Okay, okay. So well, let me let me let's have a let me question just, and you can continue the discussion after. Well, let me just say something very simple. All of those things are simply analogies is trying to describe using metaphors of things that you know about, you experience, and say, this is sort of what it's like. It's not. It's not like a bullet. It's not like a missile with waves and water. It's not like any of those things. It's just not. It satisfies different dynamical equations. And now I want to relate it to you. But you don't know the math. So what am I going to do? I'm going to look for analogies that are as close as possible. And those analogies make it seem preposterous. But it's just an analogy. We know how atoms work. We know how material comes together. We know how atoms emit light. We understand frequencies from distant galaxies. We can understand the chemical content of our sun because we have a spectrograph. We can look at the frequencies of light, and it comes from predictions of quantum mechanics and the structure of the atom. We know that. I'm not telling you it's like bullets. I'm not telling you it's like a miss. I'm not it's not. We don't use those analogies when we calculate things. We use the rules, and the rules tell us what to predict, and we see if it matches predictions, and it does. And it does to 12 digits. It's amazing. General relativity, too. 12 digits. It's amazing. It's crazy. It's not like this. It doesn't act like that. Water is made of molecules, lumps. It doesn't look like that. It looks like a continuous, transparent fluid. But I show you the atoms it's made of. It doesn't look anything like that. It's preposterous that it's made of atoms. That's crazy. No, it just is. That's the way it looks different. The rules are different. And if you don't like the rules, you know, maybe there are other universes where the, you're, you're more philosophically pleasing, as Feynman would say. I don't know. These are analogies. The analogies are always unhappy because you get to a wall and you think, that's crazy. Yes, it's crazy because it's not really like that. Okay, here we go with more crazy. Um, the, 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 yeah, it is a question. Are you a member? First, I'm not a member. Okay. Um, I, I have. I know my job up here. I have, con I have contributed. But he does occasionally give money. And my name is Kenneth Rothschild. But I was trying to think of something really outside the, the box. Okay, what, what if our perspective 
has to really be reorganized. In other words, because of the evolution of species and, and, and our brain, we seem to go from a thing to trying to get to a bigger concept of the whole thing. Okay, what if each so-called thing is just a part of a, a field and it's, it's a potential within an energy grid so that you're not going from the thing to describing a thing, you're more describing potentials within a whole energy field and, and it has certain characteristics at certain points. Do, uh, does that make any sense? You want sense? me to do something with that? Yes. It's, <laughs> no, uh, no, it, See what you can do with yeah, it. No, uh, yeah, it's something like that. <laughs> it is something like that. I mean, uh, but these are all descriptions again. I mean, we're, we're sort of limited by the descriptions. But, but, well, let me address two things. You said that evolution has brought us to, to this point. Evolution really favors us figuring out how to survive, not figure out the history of the universe or, or the structure of an atom. So we are obviously limited in that way. And it's, it's a miracle how much more we know than we should know. Evolution doesn't drive us to do the things we do. It's an artifact that we know so much about the universe and the structure of matter. But yes, we're blinded by an intuition or instinct that was built up not to discover those things. It was to do something else, find food, protect ourselves, keep warm, reproduce. Um, so why do you laugh at reproduce? You know, in Europe, nobody laughs at reproduce. Come on, America. Uh, uh, the other thing you're saying is, what if it's da da da, da? Um, I can tell you that the electron field, again, it's a description, these are all descriptions, but the electron field, we would describe every electron, every electron in the room, in your body, in the universe, as a fluctuation of a single electron field. And it's, it propagates in a way that satisfies equations that look like wave equations. And so in that sense, they're not all separate, they're all little fluctuations in the same thing. There's, it's energy stored in the field, and it's everywhere. There's no, so as far as we can tell, a grid or anything like that, because there are properties of the universe like very good uh, symmetries, rotational symmetry, what we call translation symmetry, motion, laws of physics abide by those, by translation in time. So those things say that if there's a structure, it's it's more complicated, it, has to, it seems to abide by rules that don't have uh, simple physical interpretations, at least intuitive. It's our, it's our evolutionary upbringing that don't allow us to immediately jump and know the answer. Um, so yes, I could describe it in a way that sounds <coughs> like pockets of energy as part of a larger structure that lives all over in, in space-time. But every description is usually practical for the application, not even experimental or, or industrial, but application in our trying to understand deeper about the theory itself. And so, and, and the problem is you can write uh, popular books that say some of those things and they sound great, but they're not, you know, it doesn't really capture it. Um, but it's weird, it's, it's weird, it's super non-intuitive, the rules. Um, I would recommend a uh, book by Steven Weinberg um, called Dreams of a Final Theory. Because it's, it's, the le it's less flashy than the other popular books, but it's an honest rendition of what we know and how, how we know it. Um, so that's it. So yes, something like, it's something like that. But Two last questions over here, one there and, and uh, the one just behind. Uh, my name's Jim and I'm a member. And I wasn't going to ask, the, ask this question, but you brought up the idea of the analogies that, that all fall short. And I want to go back to popular literature again, Max Tegemark and his mathematical universe. Is there a need for reality, or is it truly all just math? And the reality is just the analogy that our mind has put together to be able to function amidst all this math. Or does it matter? <laughs> So you want to know if there's a need for reality. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and okay, you, qualify. And you smartly <clears throat> blame Max Tegmark for that. Right, right. No. As separate, well, I would too. As separate from mathematics. As separate from mathematics. 
Um, I will repeat the question and then I want to answer. How about this? Great. Um, uh, is mathematics separate in some way from physical reality? Does physical reality need the existence of mathematics? Um, uh, it is amazing that the laws of physics is something we can learn and we can understand more and more of. Um, it's also maybe amazing that it is perhaps a complete mathematical system. And if it's a complete mathematical system, we call it reality, but really this is just a mathematical system playing out. We, we're reducing all physical reality and interactions that, to a set of equations and rules and properties of those equations. Um, which means maybe there's you know, a couple people on the beach drawing, you know, writing numbers on pieces of paper and passing them back and forth. And that's what physical reality is. I don't even know what that means. We're, we're in a simulation, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. It's not much of a jumping off point, unfortunately. But the most beautiful thing I've ever read about that uh, was um, there was a nice biography, I like it, by Rebecca Goldstein. Of, um, she wrote a biography, a short biography of uh, Kurt Goodell. And um, in the late stages of his life, um, he was attempting to prove the existence of God with the idea that physical reality is completely describable by a mathematical system, which means there must be truths in physical reality that cannot be known by components of the mathematical system, meaning us or anything in physical reality, which means there must be something external. And that external thing you might call God. But he was one, one, line, he was one line away from getting that proof to work, so he didn't prove it. No, he said he was stuck. He, he, he eventually abandoned it. That's why I leave that. I, I, I don't have anything intelligent to say. I don't love Max's book. But. Last question. I have a question. How does this work? Name, yeah. member? Uh, my name is uh, Shivaji Seth. I'm not a member of the, uh, the association. I have a question about dark matter. Um, we are looking for dark, dark matter particles like WIMP, as you explained, uh, through their physical interaction with matter. Uh, what is the basis, technical basis, for assuming that right. dark mat matter particles should have any interaction with the matter that we know? Good. Yeah, so far the only interaction we know about is, is gravitational, and we can put limits on the other types of interactions. The electromagnetic interaction, if there is any, it's, it's, if, it, if dark matter is a gas of new particles, electromagnetic interaction is very weak. Now, we know significant, well, we have significant evidence about the evolution of the universe. We have snapshots of the universe um, at a time which is roughly when the universe was a few hundred thousand years old. That's when photons were released from charged particles called recombination, cosmic microwave background. And then we have another snapshot when the universe was roughly a second old, and that was the time when light nuclei were forming in the early universe. It's called Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. So we, we've measured in great detail uh, the, the uh, abundances of light nuclei. We've studied in great detail this cosmological background. And from it, we can infer the rate of expansion of the universe. Um, and th from the rate of expansion, we can infer from general relativity the contents of the universe, the different components, how much matter there is, how much radiation there is, and, and lately, possibly, how much vacuum energy there is. And then, with those contents, and with knowing the laws of physics to much higher energies, as we do from colliders, we can extrapolate back. It's a near-thermal system, which means you, you, there's a bazillion things in the pot, but it's brought to approximately a given temperature, and then we know what's happening just from thermodynamics. So we can go up and up at different temperatures, and then we can ask the question, if there is dark matter, how could it have been produced, and how could it have been left over in this universe? And so part of that story is, well, here's a simple model where at some temperature, dark matter is being created and interacting with the standard model at a regular basis. It's thermalized. And so you just take a thermal history of the universe with your proposed particle, and you ask, what is the abundance of the new extra stuff? 
And to get that abundance right, it requires both the mass, but also an interaction strength, which is not gravity, it's something new. And then we take the rules of relativity and quantum mechanics and all the things we know about the standard model and we enforce those on the new sets of particles and we make predictions. And those predictions then bear out on experiments. We say, oh, if it was produced if in a thermal way, then it should have interactions at least of this strength. Because of relativity, it must be an interaction of this type. And because of what we've seen in, in particle detectors, it must be at least this heavy and it, it can't interact with the photon. Something like that. So we, that's the box. And so oh, if that's the box, we could rule out that idea with these types of experiments, as long as I get to this sensitivity. And then they go after it. The, the WIMP was an example of a particle that came out of a totally different theory, which was predicted for other reasons. And so it became a hot topic in that we sort of were excited about the other theory and experimentalists say, here's something that just automatically gives you the right abundance of dark matter and it has the, the following interactions and this is how we're going to attempt to discover it or rule it out. And so that, that was a class of, of ideas. There are something like five known ways so far for the early universe to generate dark matter in the abundance that we see. And so each one requires different interactions. At least three of them have very plausible ways to discover experimentally. The other two are quite hard and we don't know, but we're thinking about it. And that's how we do it. So there's a, it, it's amazing that both relativity and quantum mechanics add so much um, of a restriction to what new things could be added to the theory that you, you, once you have dynamics, you're put in a box. And it's absolutely true that dark matter could possibly not interact in any significant way with us. It has to interact in some way besides gravity, it seems. But it doesn't have to be very strong. But a, a few of the theories, it's strong enough, you'd predict that you'd be able to discover it if you look in the right way. Sure. Well, thank you. No, we're, we're done with questions. Because we're we'll talk already, to you afterwards. It's already 10 after. So uh, in appreciation for your giving this talk, I'd like to present you with this framed copy of the announcement of your lecture Thank you. uh, signed by the members of the general committee on behalf of the membership. I just can't. Yeah, sit down for a few minutes. Sure. Yeah. Before we adjourn to the social hour, a few closing items. PSW depends on an enthusiastic, active, and capable membership. Oh, you can't hear me? Oh, dear. So I have to start over. I don't know why you can't hear me, but I'll speak up. Can you hear me now? Okay. Before we adjourn to the social hour, there are the usual few closing items. PSW depends on an enthusiastic, active, and capable membership. If you're not a member, please join. If you are, please see me about getting involved in carrying out PSW activities. You can apply for PSW membership by going to the PSW website at PSW, I'm sorry, www.pswscience.org. And uh, <clears throat> you'll have no trouble finding the membership button, which when you press it will miraculously bring up an application for membership, which when you fill out this form, which asks you for some basic information, so we know a little about you, we'll get you down to the uh, pay dues button. When you get to the pay dues button and you press submit, don't get confused by PayPal. PayPal is our uh, merchant banking service. They just process these payments. You don't need to have a PayPal account. You'll see a couple of tab pa tabs on the payment page, which for obvious reasons I couldn't bring up because I didn't want to have to pay my dues again. Uh, and you just go to the one that says credit card and you pay with a credit card and it doesn't really have anything to do with PayPal on your side. It's really very easy. So if you're not a member, please join by using our website. By the way, how many of you are here from Meetup? How many of you are here from Meetup or are willing to admit it? No. <laughs> That's great. We love Meetup. We have almost 1,000 members on our Meetup group now. And I just like to remind people, uh, being a member of Meetup is wonderful, and we love to have you come, but it's not being a member of PSW. 
So if you are a member of Meetup, uh, we would encourage you to also become a member of, of the, I should say, if you are a member of the PSW Meetup group, we encourage you to become a member of PSW itself. Well, let's see, what else do I have to tell you? <coughs> ah, if you have any questions about membership, please see our membership chair, James Heelan, or myself. We did dues payments for due in September. If those good members who haven't paid their dues, would you please pay up? <laughs> and keep in mind that PSW is a nonprofit educational organization tax exempt under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code, at least for now. <laughs> Something's about to happen. Our next speaker will be Scott Bolton. Scott Bolton is the principal investigator on the Juno mission, which is currently orbiting Jupiter. And by the time he comes to speak at the President's Lecture on 6th of January in the new year, we should have some very interesting results from the Juno mission. So I encourage you all to come. And I have a question. How many of you are here for the movie? Oh my god. How many of you would like to have a similar event for Scott Bolton with a movie on uh, planetary exploration, in particular Jupiter? OK, we'll try and do that. Look for the notices. I had no idea it would be so popular. And finally, the spring schedule is in a work in progress. So you note that um, after Scott, we have Marty Macri at Hopkins, who uh, will be talking on medical errors, which um, some of you may know is about the third leading cause of death in the United States, which is why I always advise people to invite doctors and hospitals. He will be talking about some ideas he has for how to eliminate them using check checklists, transparency, and the free market. Uh, we're working on the 10th. The speaker for February 24th will be Brett Alexander, who is the vice president at Blue Origin. I'm sure you all know Blue Origin is the Jeff Bezos' company competing with SpaceX to get us all to Mars, or at least until <coughs> above the atmosphere for a view of the Earth. And he'll be speaking on the new space age, specifically New rocket engines and launch systems being developed by companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX and by NASA. March 10th, the speaker is likely to be astronaut and Hubble repair person John Grunsfeld, and he will be speaking on post-web very large space telescopes assembled in situ, not on Earth. As you might expect coming from John, he thinks that astronauts will be assembling those telescopes. There's a possibility that the March 10th event instead will be a set of four lectures and a panel discussion headed by Matt Mountain on very large US terrestrial telescope projects. And in that case, we'll reschedule John's talk for one of the other open dates. Finally, the speaker on April 28th will be Anthony James, professor, mosquito expert, and molecular biologist at UC Irvine. He will be speaking on mosquitoes, synthetic biology, CRISPR, gene drive and malaria, in other words, on the use of recently developed techniques for genetic modification to control disease transmission by these biting insects. We hope to have the spring semester completely scheduled before the new year, so please check the website at regular intervals for updates as it firms up. The social hour ends at 1030 after which PSW members and guests meet at the Fairfax Hotel Lounge across the street. If you're not familiar with this, please see Vice President Lloyd Mitchell in the back there with the white turtleneck, uh, or see me for information on how to get there. Please use the side entrance to exit the building. And I will now accept a motion for adjournment of the 2370th meeting of the Society to the Social Hour. Second. All in favor? All opposed?